Okay, everybody, we're here with Rita Leduc. <laughs> I did it again. <laughs> it's it's actually Leduc, but I, I I have a fondness for ducks more so than for dukes, and so mm -hmm. I I go with Rita Leduc. Yeah, but it is Rita Leduc. Um, uh, thanks for doing this, Rita. Um, um, I'm sure it's going to be different uh, than than some of the other talks I've been having with artists. Uh, I guess I, I want to start. Um, I remember back in the 90s, there was a movie called Jerry Maguire, and it had all these cheesy lines in it. And one of the lines was, um, you had me at hello. <laughs> well, Rita had me at, statement, her artist statement from her website, which I'm going to just read one paragraph from. Um, she writes, as information builds, boundaries between the chosen locations define descriptors weaken, patterns, temperatures, and oral vibrations intertwine. A synthetic effect ensues, resulting in a more porous and holistic representation of place. Interdependence grows palpable, revealing an ancient primal reciprocity and understanding. My fluency with the lexicon of land blossoms. I translate narratives of tension, courtship, and eventually communion. So yeah, you, you had me at ancient primal reciprocity. <laughs> and it's synesthetic effect, not synthetic. We wanna- Did I say synthetic? <laughs> synthetic, but that's okay. No, that's good. That's a good, just good distinction. And makes yeah, it, that's just an important. It yeah. makes it even better. Yeah. <laughs> so that's what I came across, and that's why I excitedly reached out to you. Must have been what two years ago. No, it was like last summer. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, it it anyway. I'm glad I did, and uh, at every turn, you have. Uh, confirmed and expanded my appreciation for what you're doing. So um, thank you for having this conversation. So um, let's, let's uh, for me, it, it, Oika is, is primarily about practice uh, with respect to artists. I, I make no claim and no, I claim no authority to be able to tell artists, you know, what they should do or, but I am, um, proposing that um, some artists have practices that uh, put them in touch with something that, that I feel like I'm in touch with as a scientist. And so um, I'm hoping that that's what we can sort of start with is, is your practice and your process. And if you can kind of tell me about it, tell us about it. Um, I've got your slides up and um, maybe if, if you have, a, you know, if you have a, sort of way into the conversation, um, now's a good time. So, yeah, okay. yeah. Um, yeah, you know, it's funny, like as I was experiencing the Oika coursework um, and the process that you present to um, the people, you know, going through the coursework, it was striking to me how similar it is to my own process, which is just something, I mean, I think you and I both, we sort of just made up, you know, something that we thought worked. And so I thought it was very telling that what we have both found to work is so similar. Um, even if it's just the reason why we click, uh, if you know, but, or maybe it's just something bigger. Maybe we've found something that actually does really help us integrate into a place. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I, I, so I got started with this process. Um, if you go, let's see, if you go two more slides, um, years ago when I was in undergrad, I um, started taking my paintings outside. So I was a painter, I was trained as a painter. Um, uh, and I was always um, just had, I mean, I, so, so I grew up like going camping and I was always had like a very strong connection to nature. Um, but then I also have always had a very strong anxiety um, just around time, the idea of time. Um, I have this memory of like as a very small child, I never liked going grocery shopping. And so in the grocery store, I would try to step on the reflection of the lights 
you know, like in the aisles, they have these like, you know, the lights above and there's these reflections in the aisles and you try to step on them. You can never actually get them. They huh. always move, <laughs> you know, you say, so, so, you know, my mother would be grocery shopping and I'd be bored out of my mind. And so I would start trying to step on these lights and I was, you know, it's this good game. Like I knew I could never actually win the game, but I just would always do it. And so you're playing but, with light. Right. Yeah. Um, and so this work, I would take the, the paintings outside and try to trace the shadows as the shadows moved across the canvas. And so I would go out with like two different colors um, at the same time of day on multiple days. Each day I would bring two different colors and I would try to trace the shadows as they were cast across, basically projected onto the canvas. And so it was this game, just like the lights on the That's floor, so um, cool. knowing that I could never capture the shadows true to where they were at the time that I, you know, by the time you see it, you get the paint, you put the paint down and you start making the line of the shadow. Even if you can get it in the one, but the one spot, by the time you get to the bottom of the branch, the shadow has moved. And, and so, so the paintings ended up getting a, you know, wow. having this sense of movement. So you're playing with and light and shadow. <laughs> what's that? You're playing with light and shadow or yeah. as, uh, as Goethe would have said, the deeds and sufferings of light. Yes. Yes. So, so there was sort of, there's a ridiculous quality to it um, that I think is really important that like you've never, you know, you're sort of like trying to be present, but in trying to be present, you're, you miss the present. Is this how, um, is this where the sort of the, the, what you, I'm not sure how you said it, but the discomfort with time comes in. Yeah. This anxiety, like, Oh, I gotta, I have to, I have to pay attention to my present, but in, in having the awareness of having to pay attention, you kind of miss that moment. Um, so, so, so you were a com complex child. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, so, so that was that work, and and there was maybe a like an eight year gap um, where I went to grad school. Um, I was working in the theater, so I was doing scenic design, and I was um, uh, and, and scenic painting. Um, and then I moved to Chicago, and then I moved to New Jersey, and went to grad school, and started making installation work, which was where like my theater background. Um, kind of combined with my painting background. And so I stopped making paintings and started making installations. And once I moved to Brooklyn, um, I was still kind of considered myself an installation artist. I hadn't worked on canvas in a really long time, but in Brooklyn, it's very hard to find space. And um, people don't, space is not free. People do not give you their space. And so I was making installations in inside um, and the installations were very specific to whatever site I was given. So they responded very specifically to that site. Um, but I was tired of waiting for people to give me space. Uh, I wanted to make my work. And so if we go to the next slide, that's when I decided, well, you know, forget it. I'm just gonna go, I'm just gonna go outside. And and so it, I did, and I realized how similar, uh, you know, it's like, wait, I've done this before. Um, and that was, you know, the, the paintings that I was doing in undergrad. And so this time nice. um, I, I did bring out my paint and I did bring out, uh, you can actually, I can show you when I go out, I bring out this, it's a cart. I bring this out into the woods and um, oh. it has like a whole bunch of different supplies. And um, I make these pieces, so I find I bring out a big frame. This one is particularly large because this was for a, a show. But I bring so, out. Oh, so um, let me just interrupt you. So this 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 sort of process that started as a kid playing on the floor with the light, you know, uh, and then it, it it went away for a while, or it was dormant, and then it it came back, or it, it reasserted itself when you were. So it was dormant. It just spent time inside. So it was all the same ideas. It was all, and you know, and I could go into those, but it was all about presence and um, the function of a space and highlighting the function of the space and highlighting the idiosyncrasies of the space and truly understanding that space and the architecture um, and, you know, the very subtle mark. But you, but you did go through uh, a, 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 an, an event of remembering it at some point or no? It was like it was institutionalized. Because I was like in school, and so so it was all the same ideas in my mind. It's it's a very clear like sort of linear trajectory. Yeah. yeah. Um. But it's it is it is sort of like if you were to take an ivory tower and just place it on top of this like section of eight years, um, because it, it was the same. Yeah. I, I just I'm sorry. I'm I'm just 
I'm just struck by how that has symmetry with, you know, my whole thing too. Like oh, that's yeah. another one of those little symmetries in our experiences that, that make this stuff make sense. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Yeah, no, so it, so it is all the same ideas, but once I got to Brooklyn and I was not, you know, when you're in school, you're given spaces and, and I had shows, you know, I did have shows in different locations where I was given spaces, but they're just, you know, as an artist, you want to, you want to practice all the time. And so I couldn't, I had a studio in Brooklyn, but I couldn't make work for my show in Buffalo in my studio in Brooklyn because the show in Buffalo was a, had everything to do with that particular space. So, you know, I couldn't prepare work inside in my studio because that work was so site specific. Mm. Frustrating. So I just needed to find an answer for myself. And so I started making installations that had to do with my own specific studio. But then you can't I mean, you know, then where does the work go after that? So so that's when I was just like, you know what, I gotta, I gotta go. And so I like packed up my car, I brought my sister, she packed up a lunch and we like went to the forest, like outside of the city. You had and to we break just, like, out. Started. What's that? You had to break out. Yeah, yeah. So we just like we spent a day outside, walked around, and I brought this frame. Um, let's see. You go like two more slides down. We go. We'll get back to that. So the one in the middle, the pink with the tree that's wrapped, that's the very first one I ever did. So I brought this little frame and stuck it outside because I thought, well, I'm going to make an installation outside because I've been making these installations inside. But the thing about making installations outside is you don't have any boundaries. So how is somebody supposed to know where the installation starts and stops? So I thought, well, why need a framing mechanism, which is what they call it. You yeah, know? no, I'm, I'm well aware of those. <laughs> so I thought, well, let me bring a literal frame. And so it was all just like, like again, I'm like making fun of myself or making fun of these ideas. And so I just like, I brought this frame, I put some acetate on it, um, and I just started like painting and putting things like in front of the frame and on the frame and then behind the frame. And so I'm playing with the picture plane. And my idea was that it was going to be an installation. It was going to just be like a temporary installation where like if you happen to be here, you would sit right there and look through the frame and everything aligns. Um, so uh, if you go back one slide, so this is the view through. Oh, right frame of that previous, the previous slide. Um, and so you can see sort of like the, the fabric or the paint sort of aligns with like certain tree trunks or, um, and I only, I mean, it takes like maybe I have like an hour to make these because the light, it's so important. Um, the colors I'm choosing and the lines that I'm making or the marks that I'm making often respond to the shapes that are created by the light. And so if that goes away, then the whole composition kind of crumbles. So I only have like an hour to do them. So they're kind of, I mean, and this one I did during, like there were people walking around, which I, I've never done that before. Um, so it was almost performative um, and that was interesting. But, uh, and this was actually the first, this one I just did in September. And this was the first one where I invited people to actually, um, stand in front of the piece and look through the piece wow. um, because normally what ends up happening if you go down to slide seven um is this one they get printed yeah yeah so they get printed and um mounted as if they're paintings but what you're looking at is like a photograph of what was through the frame right um this is, i'm sorry i don't want to keep interrupting you but this is well, like Bringing, I'm way out of my league talking about art, but all of this is awesome. I didn't even really know this part, like, <laughs> and the fact that oh, I just um, have so many questions now. But I'll, I'll, let's let's I'll let you keep can, going. No, I'm, no, no, you can I'll try to write, I'll write them down though. I got to write them. Down. Okay, okay, okay. Um, but what's important to note about these is that what you're looking at is just paper. So it's there's no paint on these. It's just a photograph. Um, so in a weird way, like you kind of have to see them in person to understand how digital they are. Because if you see them on a digital screen, your brain sort of assumes that there's paint on them. Um, so that was sort of another way of kind of flipping the script um, with with these and and um, yeah, the the like taking something that's super real 
uh, and super three dimensional and then just flattening it. And that's the thing that you're experiencing um, in the gallery space. And the bottom, the bottom right uh, image, those are actually five videos. Um, so they're videos of the installation. So they, 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 they're very still, they look like photos, but then you see like the water lapping or like a bird fly by one of them. There's like a cat that runs across the street. So they, um, I can send you some links to those, oh, but they're... this is way out of my league, man. This like, <laughs> I have a question that I want to get to before we move on here. So okay. when you were doing this stuff, when you're out there, mm -hmm. was there any point at which like it became palpable that it was actually a collaborative thing with the place. Did, did yeah. you know it at this point? Yeah. So when I started, I went to, I was in Brooklyn and I was going to the same spot in Brooklyn. Um, so if you go back to that other slide six, yeah, the one on the right is my Brooklyn space. Obviously. Um, <laughs> but I was sort of doing, I did like maybe 20 pieces, <clears throat> like kind of in that little area. Um, but there's just so much content. So the question became like, if I'm the idea is that I'm trying to, so, so my, my overarching goal with these is I'm trying to collect data. Basically, I want to figure out like, what are the colors that I am starting to use in response to this site? What are the textures that I'm seeing that I'm repeating? Mm. What are the compositions and the shapes? that I'm seeing repeating. This is the synesthesia um, part too, I think. Like it sounds like this, the, the groundwork for synesthesia. Yeah, my synesthesia or like synesthesia in general? Generally speaking that- you We know, haven't talked about my synesthesia. I don't know that it comes into play here, but- Okay. Um, but yeah, so so then when I make a whole bunch of them, I put them all together and I, and I try and find what's being repeated because i'm looking for what i call um the sensorial fingerprint so like the idiosyncrasies of a space like what how do you write you know if i said like what did your grandmother's house look like growing up i don't you probably couldn't draw it but you could probably describe like the quality of the light or the the color of the carpet or the way that like something she was cooking smelled mm -hmm. like you could remember these sort of notes um, and so that's what I'm, I'm trying to break down a space into its components um, that make you fully feel like you know the space and you don't even necessarily, you're not um, even able to necessarily like verbalize what those things are, but you go to a space that you know and you're awakened. Like you can feel that like, okay. That, I, yeah. I have to, sorry, cause I, I'll lose this, thi this, I, this thing, but it's, <laughs> It's what you're kind of doing is a kind of science. You're kind of it's a, there's a reductionism to it. But what you're what you're doing that science often fails to do is putting it back together into an affective, into an uh, a sensorial uh, coherent. You know, like it's it become so after you've taken it apart, acknowledged all these different sensorial things, you, you bring them back together into a, a sort of cohesive. Um, uh, experience, you know, like, yeah, that's the hope. I mean, the key though, is, is that of course, this is all only through my own lens, like the lens of my own eyes and my own hand. So like colors that I'm choosing probably aren't colors that somebody, you know, so I'm not saying like, these are like the, this bright yellow is just because I, that yellow cone was there. And so that made me use the bright yellow. So it's actually very connected to the the time that I was there and the headspace that I was in and sure. then who I am as a person. So it's, sure. it's not just here is this place. If you look at my work, mm -hmm. you will understand how you will understand this place. Well, you're integrating your own personal narrative about that in that moment to that place in which is you're doing a phenomenology. Right. And, then, and that's as far as I can go, right? I can't tell you how you would experience the place, but I can at least show you how I experienced it um, and share that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Um, so if you go to the next slide, so that's not enough for me. Um, like I go, I go to those spaces and I, uh, follow, sorry, the following slide. Yeah. Um, so when I go to these spaces, you know, making that work through the frame and getting those photographs, um, which I call integrated photographs, I don't know what to call them, but um, that's step one. And so that's how, that's sort of like my first method for gathering information. Um, but I have a, all these other methods. And so, and that's where the other media comes in. And so the reason I use these other methods is because I'm trying to, if you think of the space as like a sphere and I'm trying to kind of 
get into that space from a variety of different perspectives. And because art is the language that I know, it's the language that I'm using. So using different media and making different types of work gives me different information about the space. Um, and so I started making these graphite drawings because I, um, I actually used to be um, an archaeological illustrator. I used to draw um, like burial pots from Laos, <laughs> but, uh, but it was these very precise uh, technique. And, and I have, part of me really loves making like very, very tight drawings. And so um, these graphic drawings uh, kind of uh, humor that, that side of my artistic sensibility. And so um, what these graphic drawings do is they take the photographs and um, I redraw them. So I, I just I just look at the photograph, which don't tell my students because I never let them draw from photographs. But um, it's exactly what's in the photograph, but I leave out any of the marks that I have added. So all I'm drawing is the original environment. Um, and so it's a way to see, like, it's a way to distill the composition and see, like, ooh, how did that, and how did I, where did I let the environment kind of take the lead and where did I take the lead? And so sure. it's a way to study those shapes, but it's also a way to study the shapes of the actual um, space. And so drawing grass, for example, like the one on the right, um, it's, I have to like really stare at the grass and really figure out like, what are the shapes? What are the patterns? How do the light hit the grass? I mean, there's just these really, these ways that I have to like really study it in order to replicate it. Cause it's not a projection. Mm. I just, I just draw it. Um, and so it helps me understand the space just in a different way. It's, it's more meditative and it's more like a, like a deep listening. It's, um, you know, they take, you know, whereas the first one takes like an hour that the outside method, uh, these take day, like, you know, wow. 30 hours or something. So, um, you know, I think on their own, I mean, each of these pieces have their own kinds of conversations. Um, which we could get into, but sort of on the broader, the broader idea is just that it's another way of trying to understand and trying to research my space. Um, I mean, those negative spaces, I've, I've talked about them as um, just sort of like revealing an erasure and um, uh, this like oscillation between like knowledge and obscurity and sort of highlighting um, presence and absence. And I, I think these are maybe most directly talk about uh, like the Anthropocene possible. So, um, so, so, so this like, I mean, you you chose the right word integrated. You know, these are these the, that that's like technically what you're doing there is by by reimmersing reimmersing yourself in that other piece and integrating yourself. And so you said that you you come into this from a different perspective. You know, you're trying to enter into this sphere that you created. Yeah. Which is, which is really consistent with like, um, you know, there's this idea. I think it was Whitehead, the philosopher Alfred North Whitehead, who was talking about how that really reality is just a particular, what you said, like an entry point, uh, and it's all based on pattern. And so this work here represents that ex expresses one particular pattern from that particular moment you know, that you took, but there's an infinite number of patterns in any sphere, any scene, any reality that you could take. And that sounds very kind of uh, psychedelic in a way because it, it, and I mean that in like the technical sense, not just that it's mm -hmm. like, you know, mm -hmm. but just that it's, it's, a, it's a way of getting out of a limited perspective by, by, by really celebrating and immersing yourself in one perspective, you, come to realize that it is just one perspective and that there really is an infinite number of ways to, 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 to garner pattern out of the world. So anyway, that's awesome. I'm, I'm learning so much. <laughs> well, you can go to the next slide. Um, so, so something else, so another media that I use is collage. Um, and so this top, the top left image is a very small, probably like six inches by six inches collage. And so when I take those, when I make the installations outside, 
I take everything back with me. I don't leave anything there. And so then I have all this detritus from those installations. And so I take that det detritus and, and I cut it up and I recollect it and put it back together um, wow. and make collages. And so the collages are almost like the opposite of the graphite drawings. Is this a photograph um, of the wall here? Is this how it would be presented in like a gallery? Or what so is the one on the left or the right? Well, so they're different. Yeah. Yeah. So the one on the left is about six inches by six inches. Yeah. The one on the right is like three feet by four feet. And they're and they're presented together like this in this. No, this no I would never. I would actually never present them together. This is just to show the process. Well, I, I got news for you. You just did. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, well, I yeah, just because so it's a it's an iterative thing, and iteration is like a big part of fractals, which is one of the which, which one of the concepts we work with. So you've, I don't know. I just am just keep being blown away by how how deeply synergistic all this stuff is. But go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. So the the small collages are the so I when I go back to the studio and I'm whether you know I'm still on site but working in the studio or I'm like home no longer at my chosen location and you know still thinking about it and working on it, um, I take all the detritus and I make a whole bunch of little tiny collages and those are that's a way um, of like breaking down those formal qualities that I've captured in the photo. So like, okay, let me look at now, let me look at like all of these marks that I've made and all of these colors and all of these textures that I've used without the environment, mm -hmm. let me distill that and see what I brought home with me. Mm -hmm. um, this is all, these are all the marks that I have made. So opposite to the graphite drawings where I take away my marks in the collages, I take away the environment and I just look yeah. at what I've made. Awesome. And so just recently I started making these larger versions of the collages and sometimes they they change a bit in the process. This one is pretty like one-to-one. -one. Um, and um, the, I just, I don't know, I just wanted to make them bigger. I wanted to kind of confront the viewer in a more aggressive way. Um, and I also wanted to use materials that had more, um, like a, a a larger gradient of permanence if that makes sense so like um whereas the collages it's just a lot of paint it's a lot of acetate a lot of tape um in this large one that brown piece on the left is made out of ceramic and then like the the other that squarish shape is like a, a plexiglass with like fabric and paint so so the material and then the green is painted directly on the wall mm -hmm. so there's like a a variety of levels of, of permanence, um, which I think talks a lot about time. And, you know, I think a lot about that out, you know, the, the time that a rock spends on, on the planet versus the time that a fly spends on the planet, it's sort of the same, same idea. Wow. I also give these human names. So this is George, the one on the right. Okay. Yeah. If you go to the next slide, um, so this is another way of working. Um, there's three more ways of working, I think. Just if you, um, and so these these are mixed media drawings. And so these are where I like really give myself the ultimate freedom freedom to just sort of like abstract uh, my memory of a space. And so I sort of like I sort of fly around like aerially. I, I twist perspectives that I wasn't really actually literally able to achieve. Um, but this is where I start to feel very comfortable with the space. And I start to really feel like we've formed like a bond and a friendship and there's like a fluidity to my understanding. And so, so, even, so are these somehow linked to those original paint, those original pieces you did in the woods? I mean, is this another iteration? It is. So, and what's tricky here is I'm showing you, it's always hard because I could just show you images from only one location and it becomes a little bit more clear because you start to see the same colors and shapes and textures. Like these two drawings are two different locations. Um, like there's the, the one on the right is a desert location. So you can kind of get a, a little bit of a feeling there. Mm -hmm. And the one on the left um, is actually the same location as the, the slide with those graphite drawings. But that was, um, it was a boundary water, it's a lake on the boundary waters. Um, so if you were to see everything put together um, you'd start to see what I'm talking. I I'm going to show you in the next. Well, that's what I, that's kind of what I was wondering. I mean, are you? Do, why not let us see that continuity and that evolution? You know, as a, as, yeah, as if, part of the experience. Right. If you, um, we can go to my website and you can see that continuity a little bit better um, because I have everything broken down by place. 
by location. Okay. Um, but these two drawings are from two separate locations. Okay. Um, but they are just, so the point is just that they're abstractions of the space um, in an even, what's like in an even further, they're in an even further derivative of sure. the sure. original. Um, and if you go to the next slide, um, so these are boxes that I make um, that I was feeling like I wanted to make something three-dimensional that um, can talk about some of the sensory experiences in um, a fuller way than just like a, a visual object. Like a, so if you read what's in here, and again, these are, there's some humor in these. So there's a broken, can, you can't, no, you can't see my mouse. So there's a broken well, roof tile. I've blown it up, so. A can of cat food, uh, chain link, a chunk of asphalt, a chunk of concrete, graffiti, litter, a periwinkle mid-tone, salt, a shadow, smog, sunlight, one weed, and one yellow triangle. So you can see they get, um, <laughs> this isn't one of the funnier ones, but they get kind of abstract, right? No, that's so like, pretty funny. At like a periwinkle mid-tone. The cat food is because there were cats that would always come around. Um, sunlight. Where's the sunlight? Oh, it's this. There's like a glittery fabric up at the top, right? Um, anyway, so these were a way of like really talking about some of those like things that I felt while I was at the space or observed while I was at the space that like I didn't think they got through wow. in the other in the other mediums. But so this slide and the following slide are from the same location and you'll be able to see exactly how they, so so those colors and the, like, the yellow triangle and that yellow triangle is from that yellow cone that I talked about in the yeah. beginning. Yeah. Um, so you can, and you can see the chain link. And the grid. Um, so the one, on, these are just different installations that I've created. And again, the installations are like, yeah, like another way of synthesizing all of the information that I've gotten from the what site. Was but what's cool about the installations is that other people get to step in and experience them. Um, and so um, with both of these, like this particular space um, talked about, there was like this corner. Um, so it was like, you know, and you saw the corner, you saw the corner in that original where the, the picture with the cone. Um, and so I, what I, was feeling was this dichotomy between you're at the waterfront and so it's really windy, but there's this like corner. And so it's sort of, it feels safe, um, but it also felt kind of gross and creepy. Like I would get there and they were like, like at one point there was like, there's like some guys around every once in a while that would like come ask me what I was doing. And uh, I mean, there was just, so that's the other thing I didn't talk about, like knowing the history of the space um, that's something that I'll do. And that was another thing in the, like a uh, coursework that I noticed, like before you even, you said like, this might seem strange before you even go to a space, but like do this research about the space and research, like, you know, the geology of the space and, and then also like the culture of the space. And so the culture of this particular space was like a little shady. And so, um, the, the installations were speaking to that. And so mm -hmm. there was, um, what I, what I said about them was there was a, I'm just going to read it. Let's see. The dichotomy between freedom and barrier grew increasingly apparent, confronting the viewer with a conflicting sense of both safe haven and dead end. And so that was sort of like a distillation of my experience of that place. Mm -hmm. And so the installations provide that. And so for the installation on the left, viewers are asked to like sit in that corner behind the chain link. And the projection that you're seeing is actually a video. Um, and I can send that link too, but the video is, um, a piece of acetate that's like flapping in the wind. So the sound is really aggressive. Um, and so when you sit in that corner, you feel kind of like you're safe, you're in a corner, but you're also like behind a chain link fence and you have this like really bright light of the projection and it's like flapping at you. Sure. Um, and there's a fan too that's blowing at you. And so again, just like simulating- um, The phenomenology of the place. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Awesome. Um, so that's, that's like, those are the main ways that I break down a space and understand a space. I mean, there's like, like, like you quoted, there's like a, you know, an infinite number of ways that you could try to do that, but those are the ways, and I'm, those are the ways I've kind of stuck to. Um, but now, uh, if you go to the next slide, 
I'm investigating, these are, this is like new, new stuff, but I'm investigating, um, I made these rocks when I was in the desert. I got to the desert for a residency and I felt, um, you know, you try to take the temperature of the space every time you go and this space didn't feel like it needed me and it didn't feel like it wanted me. Um, and so I felt, I didn't think that was true, but that was just like the initial kind of feeling that I was getting. It just didn't feel very welcoming. And it might just be because like, I'm from the East coast. I'm not from the desert. So I felt, it felt very foreign to me. Um, so I made these rocks before I did. Normally the first thing I'll do is those, I'll bring that frame out and I'll start making it work. But it, that felt really, it felt like I was really imposing. And so before I did that, I needed to do something else. And so I made these rocks out of, um, they're just like cardboard and tape and paint. And I brought them around and just like took, I like put them next to things um, and put like, just took photos of them. Um, and it felt like, it felt like I was like shaking hands with the location before I like came and had coffee with it or something. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I made these and I was thinking a lot about um, like when I was driving to this location, there were a lot of rocks um, this was in the high desert in Oregon, and there were a lot of rocks that were like tumbling down from the hills. I mean, you see it in a lot of places, but I was, you know, I was alone and I had just, it was the first, I mean, I was, I left, I guess my daughter was like 18 months old and I, you know, I was feeling a lot of like guilt for leaving for two weeks. Um, and so I was driving and I was seeing these rocks and they, they felt like they were on a journey and they felt like they were traveling and I couldn't tell if they were like traveling together or if they were trying to outpace each other. And, and so I was thinking about that. And so if go to the next slide. So now I'm working on these, these more permanent rocks. So those rocks don't exist anymore, the ones that I made out in Oregon, but these rocks are, are more permanent. The, the, um, and they're coming from collages again. Um, the, they're obviously, they're not finished. Um, the one on the right, the floor piece is just a mock-up. It's not, I mean, none of these are done, but, um, but anyway, I call them rocks on an arguably solitary journey. And so they are, again, like another iteration of researching a space, but they're also kind of more their own, they're breaking out a little bit, just in the way that those rocks were kind of breaking out. Um, what is the, what is the, the adjective arguably, what's that all about? Well, because I was, when I saw them, I was questioning, like, are they all traveling together in a group? Or are they trying to outpace each other? Um, to, and what? So that, to what, becoming sand? <laughs> well, to like rolling across the road. Like they were like, cause they were like rolling down a hill. So like all these rocks, ah, okay. you know, and they were all kind of like stopped at the road, like looking both ways. And then, you know, but like, it was just, it just felt funny. It felt like they were all, like, were they all together? And like, because of the headspace that I was in, you know, I was like, I was alone and that felt really great like really, but I also was feeling like I was missing my family. So there was this like tension between like, are we alone? Are we together? Are they, are they alone? Are they, do they need each other to like keep their momentum of like the rolling? Uh, or are they trying to be the first to get to the other side? You know, I don't know. So I was just sort of like seeing that and then, you know, blowing it up into like a much more dramatic kind of, you know, that's what we humans do. And, and so now I'm, I'm revisiting them and I'm, I'm bringing them back into the studio and I want to see how they, how they play with each other. Um, so yeah, so that's a new, that's super new. It's a, it's a, it's a very deep question there, arguably. So, I mean, arguably is anything solitary, you know, I think you're kind of mm -hmm. opening, opening a channel to, uh, I don't know, some pretty profound philosophical question there. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. And then well, and also it sort of plays with the time thing because to ask these questions of rocks, you really have to, you really have to have access to a different time scale because rocks erode and move and do things at such a slow pace, a geologic. Oh, right. Yeah. Right. So like, what is a rock's journey? Like yeah. really, like what, what part of the journey do we really even see? Yeah. And you think about like, and you're in its presence for how much of its life, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Uh, compared yeah. to how much it's in your, the presence of your life and all of that. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just a really rich kind of uh, door, door there. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. So that's kind of, that's where this process kind of ends. That's, um, that's all of it. So this now. is where you are now. You're starting conversations with rocks. Yes. <laughs> awesome. Making sculptures. I've never made sculptures before. I mean, mm -hmm. I think I kind of, I keep calling them installations, but I don't know. I think they might 
they like start to get sculpture-y. Yeah. So we'll Ooh. see. Okay. Oh, so this is a totally, this is sort of like a, a tangent, a side, an aside, um, but I think it's relevant to Oika. Um, this is a new project that I'm doing and this is like very early stages. Um, but I just was starting to think about, um, like, again, so like ways of understanding your location. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I talked about like, you know, it's, it's only just, it's my experience of the location and my experience of place. Um, this is still my experience of these things, but, um, I was thinking about field guides. So I like took a bird language class and I just, I've been like, you know, you go hiking and like now I, with my kids, I like, I want to be able to tell them like what kind of tree this is and like what kind of rock this is and what, and I, um, I get really excited about that knowledge, which I don't really have. Um, and then I'll go to try to learn it and I get so bored and I just like my brain shuts down and I remember why I did not go into science. Hmm. And so um, this is my own version of a field guide. So I started thinking about like, well, how did indigenous peoples, like they didn't have, I mean, I guess they started naming things, but they also, they recognize things based on their sensorial qualities, like the texture, how the light hit it um, at certain you know times of the year, the color of it, when, they knew when the when the leaves fell. They knew when it it changed. They knew when the best time to um, harvest it, and how many to harvest, so that it still could grow. You know all these things that they knew. That's how they recognized where they were. It was all of these sensorial qualities of these uh, natural items around them. And so I thought, well, what if I make my own field guide? Um, so this is just this is like very early stages where I'm taking the things that are around me and I'm um, pulling the different qualities that I notice about them um, and making small drawings um, that re respond to those or reflect those qualities. And then the idea is that this will get turned into like a very uh, large kind of unwieldy book that I think will look like a very sloppy tree trunk. Um, that'll be like an art book uh, and it'll be a field guide to just like understanding the world around you without having to memorize Wow. anything um but just like visual cues so that's that's just sort of a side project it's also really helpful to just make uh small drawings while you're working on like larger drawings that take mm. 30 hours <laughs> so. i think what maybe you're encountering when you like when you said it was boring or you couldn't do it because it was science or whatever mm -hmm. that you're encountering that kind of inherent objectification that level of separation that science good science maintains that's the whole point of science is to separate oneself from the subject to get an objective truth about okay. that thing. And that to, you know, an artistic phenomenologist like you uh, comes across as boring or puts you to sleep. Which... Well, it's also, maybe when I say boring, it's just not how my brain works. Right. So it's a lot of energy to try to memorize these things that I don't retain. Yeah. Uh, but what I do retain is like a holistic understanding of something. and. Yeah, this is this, but this is speaking exactly to why we need this alliance between science and art. Like we need this thing that emerges when 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 we work together. You know, and I'm not saying that we need to collaborate or co-create, but we need to interact. We need to, you know, we need to share what we know and let uh, because both of those things are critical. You know, to well, yeah, and don't like you know, don't get me wrong. Like it's super important to be able to. Vocabulary is really important, right? Definitions are so important so that we can communicate to each yeah. other and know that we're talking about the same thing. So I'm not saying that those field guides have no purpose. Well, it's also I, fun, you know, you know to 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 a to a poet, language fulfills the role that some like these visual mediums are filling for other artists. You know what I mean? Right. So right, but I, I think what I'm responding to is just like. Yeah, I want to know what that tree is, but I don't really care what it's called. I just want to know, like, what that tree is, how that tree is, or who that tree is, yeah, or yeah, you know, like how well, that. Tree, you, yeah. you know what though? But it's for me. It's like, and I'm not saying this is right or wrong, but for me, it's like I want to know what that tree's name is, so that when I see it again, I can, I can. It's a friend, you know. It's an acquaintance, and I, you know, like. 
it just helps to know the bird's name or he- know the bird's song, especially because then mm-hmm. you, 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 you're in the presence of a friend and every one of those encounters is an opportunity uh, to cultivate the friendship, to cultivate that mm-hmm. rapport, that affection, that, that sense of belonging. That's mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So um, this is awesome and that is beautiful. So mm-hmm. I'm dying to see where you go with that. Thank you. Where are you gonna go with that? Ah, I'm just gonna keep making it. Yeah, yeah. Um, this is what I feel like all the time. Okay. <laughs> You're a giant. Talk, do, you want, do you want to talk about groundwork? Yeah, I mean, so groundwork uh, is a, so it was groundwork. I started groundwork in 2014 mm-hmm. um, with a friend of mine, Patricia Brace. And um, the idea here was, and, and like, I'm kind of always trying to think like it's, obviously it's so related to my practice, but it's also so different. Um, I like, you know, I like interacting with people and I was trying to think about, but at the time I was living in the city and I knew I didn't want to always live in the city. And so I was trying to think, how can I keep interacting with people but not have to go into the city? And how can I bring people to me? Um, And I, you know, I, I, my undergrad was at, not at an art school. And so I have all these friends that don't make art. And that was really important to me. Like that was intentional. I didn't want to go to an art school. I wanted, uh, you know, artists make art about not just art. So it's like actually really important to know not just art. And, and so I have all these friends that do all these really cool things. And so now as an adult, I start meeting other people and thinking, oh, you should know this person. And then I think you're never going to get to know this person because this person does neuroscience and you do, you know, performance art. And, and you would never cross paths unless I make you cross paths. And so that was that was one of the, um, you know, the, these again, I guess it's, it goes back to the boundaries thing. Whereas, you know, I go try to break down these boundaries out in the woods. Oh, I have, I have some dear friends around me. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I go out and I try to break down the boundaries for me when I go to these locations. But with groundwork, I'm trying to break down these sort of societal boundaries of putting everybody into their own little, you know, metaphorical or literal uh, cubicles. Um, So that's one part of groundwork. The other part was that, you know, it's hard for people to go away for, you know, some residencies or like a month, three months. So, so groundwork is a, is a, is a, is a a short term residency collaborative. Short term interdisciplinary residency that focuses on process over product. Nice. Nice. And I can attest to that because I've participated in one. I'm an alum of groundwork. Yes, uh, mm-hmm. I still think about it and I still uh, I, I miss the people I was with. And uh, it was beautiful. And I'm psyched to do more. Yeah. Well, for us, I mean, it was, I'm so grateful. It was right before the outbreak. Yeah. And it, we got it in right before. And it felt like it filled me up. Yeah. Um, with, like interaction, you know, and, um, that was really helpful. It was good. And it's a novel experience for me to interact with artists and to listen, you know, just to kind of mm. observe what y- you guys are thinking about. But, you know, I think uh, something you said early on here about, and you mentioned it again, that it's about cha- crossing the disciplinary boundaries. And there was that time when you were out in the woods doing your acetate stuff and you're setting it up and people would come up to you and then it started to feel like a performative thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that that's, that's touching on this idea that artists need to, I think, and and we can talk about this in in more depth, uh, but the point is that artists need to be more communicative about what they do, uh, as, as, as an integral aspect of, of creating art. Now I might be breaking all the rules, you know, like I'm just this bumbling scientist who's posing as somebody who knows anything about art, but um, that might not be the done thing to like talk about your work, but you're doing such an amazing job. And like, you just, you just totally exponentially enriched the experience of your work by, by giving me all that background that, you know, like, Mm -hmm. and and I, I get it. Artists don't want to like talk about their work or they want it to be, no, I actually, yeah. well, I, I actually, so I think artists do want to talk about their work. Um, artists, most artists are like just, just itching to talk about their work, but they're trying the, the outlets that allow us to talk about their, our work, or at least like where we're, 
looking for those outlets are still within the quote unquote art world. Um, and so there's a lot of barriers there and a lot of like mystery and a lot of um, competition. Um, and so the opportunities are few and far between. And so I think going back to this breaking of boundaries, I think if artists were to reach outside of that art world boundary and start talking about their work in other contexts, which I do think, ha I mean, it, it definitely happens, but I think that, um, you know, they'd get a different audience and maybe that audience isn't like as, as fancy or as much of a like a uh, testament to like where they are in their art career. But I think that like, that's an audience that's like very important. I mean, I like, I mean, even speaking at universities, it's, it's hard to get that to happen. But like, I love speaking to students cause they just like, they eat it up. And I feel like, yeah. um, and their questions are so just like thoughtful. And the well, they're in they, that, they're in that mode and, and they're in that yeah, period yeah. of the career and development where that those are the questions that they need to be asking, you know, the, yeah. the, they're, they're, they're developing at that point. But I think a lot of the art talks happen at galleries. They happen at like organizations that are like, you know, for the arts. And so you're talking to your, your people. Um, which is great. Like we, you know, we need to know who our people are and like listen to what they're working on. Yeah. But like, if we also talk to people who are not your people, um, that that's also, that expands everything. Something you know? about that though, it just sort of, it, I don't know. It just, I think it's such a, uh, it, it just sets a tiny stage for right. the work of artists. So here's what I'd like to do, if you don't mind, because um, we've been going for an hour here. Um, I would love to just do this in two parts. So I, I'd like to have that juicy conversation that, we, we, that we've been having um, mm -hmm. as a kind of part two bonus material in, in, in its own YouTube. And mm -hmm. so what I'd like to do is just uh, kind of finish, wrap this up, and then have okay. that conversation quickly, uh, okay. if that's all right. Um, yeah. Is there anything that you just kind of want to leave us with, or if not, that's okay. But if if not, I'll I'll do I'll just sort of close things up. Yeah, no, I don't think so. Um, and you can also like if you need to cut anything out because it's too long, like that's fine too. I'm still recording like, right now, so. Okay. <laughs> yeah, um, no, I don't have. Um... Oh no, it's not too long at all. I just think that. Um, um, uh, we, we we need a break and then and, and then i'll have a and i want to have this other conversation uh in a way you know that's like separate from this mm -hmm. and, and i don't know i just it just seems like a good point to do that yeah yeah, yeah. all right so i'm going to put all the links that you mentioned to your website there's your website link but i'll put it all yeah, on the, you know, I, I think there was like a couple of videos that i was going to yeah, send you so any videos yeah. that you have i'll put them in the show no, the notes for the youtube video mm -hmm. uh, and uh, awesome. So thank you, Rita. Uh, and uh, if I'm going to stop the recording now, but don't go okay. away. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Rita. I'll send you the link. That was, yeah. that was awesome, by the way. So thank Good. you. I learned so much. All right, now I'll stop it. Okay.